I, I do think that Dead Ringers is one of his very best films. I was looking at them all recently because I needed to choose extracts for a talk I was going to give about my work. And there are se several of them are, are absolutely, they're all terrific films. One or two of them rise up as being really outstanding. And this, this is one of them. We'll use these. Tools and we will do the job. I, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with these instruments, Doctor. It made a lot of people feel very uncomfortable and disturbed, but I, I'm all for that. <laughs> interest in cinematography was, was aroused at a very young age because my father was a cinematographer and he used to come home with little bits of test, test strips of film, which in those days they gave to cinematographers and they could shoot. It was a, a frozen image I printed 20 different ways. And I, I took these bits of film and I became really fascinated with them. And then maybe at the age of six or so, I saw my first moving film, which was a Charlie Chaplin film. And just generally I was very interested in creating images because I could see that my father was doing that with his still camera. And I knew that he went off to make something mysterious called film. I didn't know what it was, but I, I wanted to know more. Where did you get that instrument? We had it made for us. Really? It might be fine for a cadaver, but it won't work with a living patient, I can tell you that. When I met David Cronenberg, I hadn't seen any of his films. Uh, I thought of him by reputation as a maker of horror films, and I don't like horror films. I don't enjoy horror on the screen. So I hadn't seen any of his films, I'm ashamed to say. I, he had seen some of mine enough to, to want to meet me anyway. Yeah. Look, uh, David, I've got to go. Yeah, I've got company. Right, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye. It was a period when he um, had just, uh, when he was basking in the success of The Fly, and for one or two reasons he felt he needed to look for a, a new cinematographer with whom to continue his work, because the one he was working with was either unavailable or they felt they both needed a change. Subsequently, I mean, almost straight away, I saw The Fly and could see that this was a really interesting filmmaker that I had in front of me. As soon as we started to work together on the very first day of shooting, I knew that this, I, ha I was lucky enough to be working with a first-class director of great intelligence and, and artistic discretion as well. So I felt extremely lucky and I continued to feel lucky on every film with him. Are you still doing the miniseries? Reshoots. The director didn't know what he was doing. He didn't tell me um, how to shoot the film visually, and he never, he never really has. We're, we're both surprisingly um, similar in our approach to, to filmmaking. We do think uh, about things a lot. He probably far more than I do. But um, our approach is, once, once the, the script is there, and once we find ourselves about to make the, f the film, we both say to each other, we don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's what he says to me. I still don't know what I'm going to do, he says, uh, the night before we're shooting. And I say the same. I, we both have enough craft within, within ourselves to feel that we can produce, he can produce a scene and I can produce an image. But I'm not sure what sort of image I'm going to produce until I start work with, with the actors, I see a rehearsal because he doesn't rehearse before a film. He rehearses for the first time actually in the set as we're about to shoot. So I watch the rehearsal and I begin to get ideas about how, where the light should come from and where to put the camera and which lens to use. 
I don't start a film being sure that I want to make it in this or that style. I change my style, I think, subtly, I hope. I don't, I don't put on a, a new coat every time. My style isn't something you can put on like a coat. But you can't produce genuine work if you, if you, honest work, if you do it that way. I think it has to come from the inside once the, the material of the film has been absorbed. And by that I mean the script mainly, and then the, the actors' faces once one knows that I know the casting, the clothes they're going to be in, and crucially the locations or the studio sets that we're going to be working with. It's like a patchwork quilt that you slowly put together. David feels um, comfortable working with people he's worked with before, so long as they've performed well for him. Consistently he's worked with a few key people. Others have changed, but he's worked consistently with the same editor, Ronald Sanders, and the same production designer almost every time. I've only known one exception, I think. He works with uh, Carol Spear, and I work closely with her as well. And his sister um, does the costumes, and they're, they're all equally important to me. It's consistently um, relaxed, and uh, relaxed and serious at the same time. Everything is uh, feels as though it's directed to getting the best possible work from everybody. So it's friendly, um, but everybody feels challenged to do their best because we're all aware that we're working on every time on a, a difficult film, in conceptually or intellectually um, difficult films. His films. Are, uh, have always been challenging for me to work on, and I think they brought up the best that I can that I can do, for better or worse. Mm, he's he's quiet and funny as well, so he's a real pleasure to work with. Ev, this is not for internals, remember? This is for surgical retraction. No wonder it hurt her. No, no, it's not the. There's nothing the matter with the instrument. It's the body. The woman's body was all wrong. We had to think of a, a variety of tricks to perform in order to convince the audience that there were two uh, characters on the screen played by the same actor. So we used a double very often for shots over the shoulder of, of, a, of a double, dressed the same way as Jeremy Irons. We used split-screen work and motion control. Now motion control had, was a very fresh invention when we made that film. It, it hadn't been there long at all. It was the first time I'd ever heard of it or, or seen it. And we only used it four or five times in the film. It was on one occasion, we had a motion control dolly of re relative, today it would be seen as, as a primitive piece of apparatus. And I can remember that the electrics of it blew up and burnt out. And we had to wait two weeks whilst they repaired it and start the shot again. We had, a very, for, it, for, the, for the time in which we made the film, we had a very sophisticated video set up on the studio stage where we were working, which allowed us to actually mix two takes to, together. If we did, if we had Jeremy Irons playing one twin on the left-hand side of the screen, and then we did another uh, shot where he was on the right-hand side of the screen, we could actually combine the two together. I'd never seen this. This was new to me also. Wait a minute. This is serious. No, it's not. Yes, it is. If we didn't share women, you still be a virgin? No. You never get laid on your own. I've worked with Jeremy Irons three times, I think. That was the first time on Dead Ringers was my first experience. He's a very fine actor, really professional, and um, I think every actor loves the idea of being on the screen twice. It's every actor's dream <laughs> fulfilled. And he rose to it. It was a real challenge at the same time. I'm, te I'm teasing him, but or actors in general. But um, he found it a, a stimulating challenge. I hardly ever saw him get confused between the characters. Once I saw him hesitant as to which character he was supposed to be playing. Listen, so that I know which one of you is which, I'd like you... Coral. Coral. To call me Coral. 
call me Ellie. And you, Mimsy, to call me Bev. I still think of Dead Ringers as one of the best films that I've worked on. Every film, uh, when, it, when it's edited, take, takes on a life that's slightly surprising, slightly different from that which you imagined. And that brings me to a, one key person whom I omitted from, the family of artists that D David works with, and that's Howard Shaw, who's written the music for all the, all the films and gives them all a very particular tone. And you can almost recognise over the credits that it's uh, a David Cronenberg film before his name comes up because of the music. I didn't assume that David would ask me to work, to work with him on the next film or the subsequent one, any, any of them. I didn't take it for granted. I've learned not to take anything for granted because you can be very disappointed when people change their minds. But I've always been really delighted when David's called me and told me that he has another project.